hello guys welcome to my channel once again this is the first um of the videos in this series how to study various courses in medical school i will begin with how to study pathology i don't know what you've heard about pathology how scared you are of the course how your experience in pathology have been if you are about to study pathology this is a perfect video for you and if you've gone through pathology over the years and you feel like you want to revisit the course this is also a good video for you the number one thing I'm going to ask you to do in your journey through pathology is to do what your lecturer asks you to do. So you want to follow what you are told to do, do what your school asks you to do, okay? You want to do, follow whatever books your school have recommended, whatever materials they have asked you to use. Please make sure that you at least attend to those. And then I'll give you these tips. This video is not a video about books. This video is not a video about materials. There are books out there that you can use. There is the Robbins test book, there is the Rubin's test book, there is the PRS. There are a thousand and one books out there, including review materials, right? You can do well to check out videos on YouTube. You'll see books, videos that talk about books. And if you really need me to talk about books that I use personally, I will make a video for that. But right here in this video, we are going to look at what to do as you study pathology. No matter the material you are using, what do you need to pay attention to? Number one, if you've not done pathology before and you are maybe on a break or something, I would advise you to do this one thing. Or if you're just starting out, pick up the Robbins test book, not the biggest of them, the basic, smaller size Robbins, and go through the first four chapters. Why do I say the first four chapters? The Robbins book is supposed to be a reference book, in my opinion. I don't think you should be reading that book well, some students do actually. If you can, that would be beautiful. But if you can't, if you're like me and you can't, I don't think you should read the Robbins textbook. But those five, first four chapters, I think, are very essential to forming a very stable foundation for pathology. And this is where I think a lot of students miss out on it. Those chapters are going to form the bedrock. All diseases you're going to learn about, even your bacterial infections and autoimmune diseases, whatever it is you're going to study in pathology as you move along, are going to be built on those first four chapters. So whatever you do, please make sure that the first four chapters of your pathology, try to do them from the Robbins textbook, and that would be very helpful. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is to know the name of the disease. Know the name of the disease. A lot of students learn big names that provide little information. For example, von Recklinghausen disease. That sounds quite sophisticated to me, but it, I don't think it helps me so much. But if I say neurofibromatosis type 1, neurofibromatosis tells me something about this disease, right? It tells me something about this disease. If I say pseudotumor cerebri, and if I say idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which one do you think provides you information as to what the disease is all about? That's what I'm talking about when I say know the name of the disease. So when you study for certain diagnosis, choose among those, especially those of them with alternative names, choose those names that provide you at least with some information about the pathophysiology or what the disease is all about. The third thing I'm going to ask you to do is to focus on specific findings. Focus on specific findings. Things like temperature, respiration, or respiratory rate are not specific to diseases. Right? They may, they, may, they may help you characterize diseases, but they don't give you definite diagnosis most of the time. If I say someone has a high temperature, temperature of 35, 36, well, high temperature, 37, 38 rather. If someone has a, a high temperature, you probably are thinking of a bacterial infection. It doesn't tell you what particular infection, right? That's what I'm talking about. So focus on findings that are specific to diseases. If I say Rolo formation or Rolox formation, or however you pronounce that, you wouldn't need someone to remind you that that is multiple myeloma. It comes easy because in the whole of pathology, it's only in multiple myeloma you have that. Or at least almost only, right? Or it's the biggest one we need to know. So you want to learn things that are specific to diseases, specific findings, specific findings that are going to help you a whole lot. The number four thing you want to know is that common things occur commonly. The number four thing you want to know is that common things occur commonly. My pathology teacher will always say that. There are a lot of us that learn excesses. I call them excesses. They are important. But given that you want to learn or prepare for an examination, there are excesses. The exam usually will test you based on what occurs commonly. And really, if you go to the hospital settings, 
a lot of the patients you're going to see are going to be presenting with common issues. So you want to know the most common cause of a disease. What is the most common cause of this disease? Where it applies. You want to know the most common cause of death. What is the most common cause of death in SLE patients? What is the most common cause of death in patients with multiple myeloma? What is the most common cause of death, right? You want to, you want to actually check, have sort of a checklist for most of your differentials or most of your diagnosis. Have a checklist where you look through the most common cause of the disease, the most common cause of death in that disease, right? The next thing you want to pay attention to is the age and population distribution. The age and population distribution. Now, there are diseases that are found in younger in children. There are diseases that are found in middle-aged patients. There are diseases that are found in the elderly. If you talk about autoimmune diseases, you just look it. Most likely to be a middle-aged woman, right? If you talk about Kawasaki disease, it's going to be a child. This would help you, at least for the most part, differentiate between several pathologies to make you not pick stupid options, as I would call them. Because when you see someone giving a vignette, and it's a 67-year-old man, and they pick Kawasaki as the answer. You begin to wonder how, right? You don't want such errors. Those are unforgivable errors, I call them. So you want to know the age group certain diseases is usually found in. You want to know the population distribution. Is it more in males or more in females? Well, in the exam, if it's more in males or females, they can mess around with it. But oftentimes, they will still make the veneer to say a man or a woman, right? So you want to pay attention to the age and population distribution. The next thing you want to know is the most common presentation of that disease. What structure is most commonly affected? What structure is most commonly affected? If someone is to ask you a question on good pastures disease, I'm sorry if you don't know understanding of the words or the diagnosis I mentioned here, no problems. In your journey through pathology, you're going to learn about that, right? Or as we go through, we'll also talk about most of those things. If someone asks you about good pastures disease, they would most certainly talk about the glomerulonephritis and the respiratory part of it, the hemophysis, right? Most likely, those symptoms are going to be there. So if I'm giving you a vignette and I'm talking about back pain and leg pain, it is less likely to be good pastures disease does that make sense? So you need to know the structures that are affected in certain diseases. The structures. Sometimes you don't even remember the minute details, like the immunofluorescence you, um, and in good pastures. You may not remember that, but you just know, okay, good pastures affect the kidneys, affect the lungs. So, well, although I'm not sure of what they're telling me, I'm not sure what this immunofluorescence means, for example, I know I'm seeing the kidney, I'm seeing the lungs. This may be good pastures. Of course, there are other diseases like wetness and lomatosis that will do the same thing. But at least you have a good way to think, a good place to start, right? What I'm giving you is a good place to start. The number five thing I'm going to ask you to pay attention to or that you will need to pay attention to is common diagnostic and lab findings. Common diagnostic and lab findings. You want to take note of certain histologies and histopathologies. There are some histologies that are classic, that are classic, like the mosaic pattern in Paget's disease, classic, right? You want to know these histologies. What does a granuloma look like on histology? Classic. You will always encounter them. When you encounter such things, try to look at them and learn them. Try to know them, histologies and histopathologies. You want to know common chest x-ray, MRI or CT findings. Common chest x-ray, MRI or CT findings. Come to think of it, pulmonary edema, for example, pulmonary edema or pleural effusion, those are common chest x-rays that you can be given. When you see cardiomegaly, right, or widened mediastinum, we should to be more correct, I would say. Widened mediastinum. You should be able to recognize on chest x-ray that the mediastinum is widened, right? And then no certain things that could cause that. So you want to know common x-ray. There are x-ray findings that are quite common on whatever exam you are taking. If you're on the USMLE, there are a couple. If you're on the PLAB, a couple. If you're whatever exam at all you are looking to write, there are common x-ray findings. And it will be good that you acquaint yourself with each of these findings. You want to know culture findings. Common culture findings. If I give you um, epithelial cells surrounded by maybe inflammatory cells, neutrophils and all that, well, intraepithelial, uh, 
forgetting how to arrange that sentence exactly. But culture findings, culture finding, what type of cells? If I what I was trying to describe was clue cells, actually, right? Clue cells or bacterial vaginosis. So if I describe a clue cell, that's a finding you can have maybe on microscopy or whatever. Will you re recognize that this is clue cells and this is bacterial vaginosis? You want to recognize these findings, right? You want to recognize findings on culture. You want to recognize certain stains if you're in microbiology, if you're looking at infections and all that. These are going to help you establish diagnosis. These are the things that you have to know before you step into an example for pathology. The next thing that you should know is antibodies antibodies so when i talk to some students i ask them some questions about antibodies and they seem not to remember that it looks like something people don't pay so much attention to if i say anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies you should know the disease that i'm probably talking about if i say anti centromere antibodies you should know some disease associated with that if i say anti ana if i say ana anti ana like anti-nuclear antibodies right you should know that that's SL. so you should know certain antibodies right certain antibody findings they just throw these things here and there in the vignette and if you know them voila you get an easy one with your vignette right you get an easy diagnosis or stuff like that the next thing i want you to learn is triads and pentads triads and pentads triads and pentads what are triads when you pick a certain pathology you can notice that three features stand out there are three features that when you put them together most likely, the most likely um, diagnosis that they're going to arrive at is this particular diagnosis, right? For example, if I give you polyarthralgia, tenosynovitis, and dermatitis, polyarthralgia, tenosynovitis, and dermatitis, or pustos, what would that be? If you've not done pathology before, that may be difficult for you. But that is gonococcal arthritis, right? Microbiology could also teach you that. That is gonococcal arthritis, polyarthralgia, tenosynovitis, and dermatitis, postos. We'll go into all this stuff when we begin looking at rapid review. But you want to be able to almost collect all your various diseases into triads. And then when you see those triads in your vignettes, you should be able to recognize them. We we'll go through all of those things in rapid review. Rapid review is the most beautiful thing I have encountered in my work in medical school. Working on rapid review is my pleasure. So we'll talk about them in rapid review. But you should do that. Triads, pentads, they really make your life easy in pathology. Finally, practice questions, practice questions, practice questions, practice questions. There is no genius. There are just students that have studied more than others and probably done more questions than the rest of us. Right? Spend time doing questions. As you practice questions, you're going to see a pattern. You're going to see that there is a pattern to things. You're going to notice that, well, this thing is actually easy. You begin to see how the questions are set. You want to be able to speak the language of the exam you want to write. Right? If it's your personal teacher in class, that would be easier for you to do. If it's the USMLE, you want to know the language of the USMLE. You want to understand the language of CLAB. You want to understand the language of the Canadian exam. Whatever exams it is you are looking to write, you want to try to see how you can understand the language that the examiners are speaking. And the only way to do that is what? Practice question. Right? Practice questions. Practice questions. As a bonus point, I'm going to tell you one more thing. Don't tell anybody I told you this. But go around and diagnose people. Just be a little paranoid, right? Be a little paranoid. Go around and diagnose people. You know, I go around and I see somebody limping. And I, I'm thinking, maybe he has this. Probably he doesn't have that, right? But I mean, I'm just experimenting. I'm just stretching my brain a bit. Those things are going to help you actually process pathology, right? Process pathology. Someone has a stomach pain. Hmm. You think of all the evil things that can happen to someone or that can cause stomach abdominal pain, even if it's probably because they just overeat. Be a little paranoid and put your pathology into use. Thank you very much. That's the end of this video. Go keep crushing pathology and I'll see you in the next study series. Make sure to click like and subscribe if you have not done that already and share this video with friends. Help someone get better in medicine. See you in the next video.